Mother's Day. We do appreciate mothers very much, and we thank you for, for all that you do. And I'd like for us to just pray for the mothers right now. Oh, Father God, we, we thank you for uh, this wonderful day that you have made. Lord, this is the day that you have made. May we be glad and rejoice in it. And Father, we thank you that in your wisdom, when you created the, the heavens and the earth, that you also created motherhood. You have given us mothers who, who have loved and nurtured us and taught us the ways of the Lord. And we honor and thank you for the mothers who are here with us today, Lord. May you bless them, encourage them, affirm them in their role of mother. May they look upon their role with honor and, and pride. And may you continue to give them wisdom and strength and the, the grace that they need to be the godly mothers that you have called them to be. And Lord, we pray for those whose mothers who can't be here today due to illness or passing away. May you comfort all of us, Father, who have lost a mother, and we're, we're, uh, this is not a happy day for us, Lord. Uh, may you comfort us as only you can. And Father, I know that there, maybe there are some here today who, who have not experienced godly mothers in their lives. Father, I pray that you would comfort them as well. Father, please be with us today. Wrap your arms of love around us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we give all the mothers here a big round of applause? We thank you, mothers, for all that you do. You know, some, some things, I came up with a list with some things you will never hear your mother say. Be good, and, and I'll get you a BB gun for Christmas. Okay? Run, bring me those scissors, hurry. Okay? Well, if your friends did it, that's good enough for me. Okay? Oh, don't bother wearing a jacket. You won't get sick. Okay. You don't have a tissue? Just use your sleeve. Okay. <laughs> now, how on earth can you see the TV that far back? Move closer. Okay. <laughs> Let me smell that shirt. Yeah, it's good for another week. Okay. You don't have to call me when you get there. I know you're all right. You don't have to eat your vegetables if you don't want to. And... When I was your age, yeah, I did that too. Now, we probably won't hear our mother, our mother say these things, but the things that our mothers have told us, well, they've been important and, and meaningful. And we thank God for mothers because they have helped us become the, the, the men and women that we are to, today. And I believe that mothers are a gift from God. Our passage this morning is 2 Timothy chapter 1. If you want to turn in your pew Bibles, page 165 in your pew Bible. 2 Timothy chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 3 through 5 initially, and then we're going to look at chapter 3 of 2 Timothy. But in these passages, we're presented with, one of, I believe, one of the greatest models for motherhood. Now, while I'm addressing motherhood, understand, uh, men, this is for us too, okay? Even though I'm gearing it towards motherhood, it, it's for men as well. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, page 165 in your pew Bible. If you're there, let me know by saying, uh-huh. I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience, the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you even as I recall your tears, so that I may be filled with joy. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that is in you as well. So we're going to look at Eunice today. And Eunice was a, a, a godly Christian mother who had great influence upon her children. And her, her son was Timothy. Now, Timothy was one of uh, Paul's missionary companions. He was very valuable to, to Paul. In fact, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 20, Paul says, I have no one else like him. Than, than Timothy. Timothy stood above everybody else. He was a godly man. He was a great man. He was a servant of the Lord. He put others' needs above his own. And no doubt Paul had an influence on Timothy's life, but his character development and his Christ-like walk began way before he met Paul. In fact, it began in, in the home. Timothy's training, uh, it says, began with his mother and his, his grandmother. They had a great influence on his life. Look at Acts, keep your place there, look at Acts chapter 16, page 106 in your pew Bible. And this gives us a little bit about Timothy's uh, uh, home life. Acts chapter 16 gives us an idea of Timothy's home life. 
Uh-huh. Page 106 in your pew Bible. Okay, we got to synchronize our uh-huhs, okay? If you're there, let me know by saying uh-huh. All right. He came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was a Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. So we assume he was not a believer because Paul didn't state that, and he was a Greek. The brothers of Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decision reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. So from this passage, we can gather that Timothy's mother was a Jew. She came to believe in Jesus Christ as, as the Messiah, and she entrusted her life to, to Jesus as, for her Lord and, and Savior. And Timothy's father was a Greek. He was a, a, an unbeliever. So in Timothy's home, he had a, a, a godly mother, and he had a godly grandmother. But his father was, was not a Christian. So I want to look at some gifts that every godly mother and grandmother could give to their children. And I want to stress, grandparents, you still have a powerful influence in your grandchildren's lives. As this, as this passage here is going gonna, is gonna to demonstrate, I'm going to illustrate here. So let's look back at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. And I want to look at some gifts, moms and dads, but I'm, I'm speaking uh, specifically to the moms today. So I want to look at some gifts that you can transfer down, you can give to your children. And if you have your bulletins here today, and there's an outline of today's sermon, the first gift is the gift of faith. Faith. Look back at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Paul said of Timothy in 2 Timothy 1, verse 5, that he especially remembers of Timothy his great faith. Do you see it? He says, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And now I am persuaded lives in you also. Now the faith he's talking about is just not believing, but it's an active faith. It's a, it's a faith with feet. Uh, he says this faith came from your mother and your grandmother. Again, it shows the great influence that grandmothers can have on their grandchildren. Uh, uh, Timothy's grandmother had a great impact in his life. In fact, the faith that he received, where did he receive it from? In the passage, we, where did Timothy receive his faith from? From his mother. Where did his mother receive it from? Grandmother. You see the, the impact that this godly grandmother had in Timothy's life that the grandmother's faith was passed down to, to, to his mother, and then he received it as, as well. Now, did you ever think that you could pass down faith? Did you ever think that you could pass down lack of faith? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of things that you can pass down to your children. Uh, you could pass down the genes. You could pass down antiques. You could pass down uh, uh, cars or pictures or whatever. But I think the greatest thing that you could pass down to your children is, is faith. And understand something, though. No, faith is an individual response, and it's, it's internal. But I believe that parents, moms and dads, you can greatly influence your, your children's faith. I want you to notice two things Paul pointed out about the, this faith. A, it was a, a living faith, if you want to fill in your handout. It was a living faith. 2 Timothy 1.5 says, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now lives in you. Right? The mother got it from the, her mother, and now she passed it down to her son. And this was a living faith. It was more than just talking. It was an, it was an action. And he was taught how to live out his faith. You see, our, our children need to see in our lives our faith demonstrated. They don't, they don't want to just hear about the Bible. They just don't want to hear about God. They want to see it in, in your life. Don't just quote scripture to them. Live it. And you can't tell your children, do as I say, not as I do. It doesn't work because they're going to do what you do. If you want your children to trust in the Lord, then you know what? In difficult times, let them see you trusting in the Lord. 
Show them how to trust in the Lord. If you want your children to, to, to uh, uh, love the Lord, then show them. This is what loving the Lord looks like. If you want your children to be honest, then show them. This is what it means to be honest. Your actions speak louder than your words. Second description of faith, it was a sincere faith, he said. Paul remembered Timothy's sincere faith. Uh, in other words, it's without hypocrisy. It was real, it was genuine, it was sincere. It wasn't just professed on Sunday. It was lived Monday through Saturday as well. It was a sincere faith. You know, one thing about kids, they can pick up on her hypocrisy in a heartbeat. If our children see us say one thing on Sunday and do something else on Monday, well, by that disconnect that they see in your life, that's going to seriously undermine the faith that they have. Amen. Sincerity doesn't mean perfection. If perfection was a requirement, I don't think any of us could, could qualify. Sincerity means being honest and genuine and authentic. In other words, you know what? If you're wrong, admit you're wrong. Own up to your, your mistakes. You know what? We're not perfect. And sometimes if our children see that honesty in us, uh, that, they'll learn more from that than if you try to act like you know everything and you're never at fault. Be honest. Be sincere. Timothy got to see real, lived-out faith in, in his parents' life or in his mother's life, in his grandmother's life. Let me ask you this morning. What type of legacy do you want to leave behind to your children? Will you show them what true, sincere Christian faith looks like? It's not a perfect faith, but it's a real faith. It's an honest faith. There was a young man of, of great intellect. He heard many sermons. He studied the Bible. He, he was witnessed to by, by many people, but he refused to believe in and accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And it wasn't until his mother was being lowered into the ground that he looked upon his, his mother and he said, I want that which made my mother what she was. And he became a Christian after she died. You know, the, the power of real faith, of faith lived out. Let's look at the second gift. The second gift was the foundation of Scripture. The first gift she passed down to Timothy was faith. Sincere faith, genuine faith, real lived out faith. The second thing she passed down was Scripture, the foundation of Scripture. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, page 166 in your pew Bible. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. You, however, continue in the things you have learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for repute, for correction, Correction for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So Paul wrote this letter to Timothy. He was in a tough area. Uh, he was struggling. He was dealing with difficult people. Uh, uh, first five verses of chapter 3 says, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. And this describes the people in the area where he was at. He says they'll be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. So Timothy was having a difficult time. He was finding it difficult to live a godly life in this ungodly area. As he was trying to progress towards holiness and godliness and stand firm in the word, it's, Paul says, you know what, they're, they're going from bad to worse. They're progressing in evil. But Timothy, don't you do that. You remember what you learned from, from as a child. Remember the scripture you were taught. You stand firm in the truth of God's word that was, was taught to you. And it wasn't easy. It's like swimming upstream. It's been said even a dead fish can go with the current, right? 
You know, if, if you're going to go against the culture, if you're going to live differently than what the culture says, understand you're going to run into resistance. It's going to be difficult for you to live a Christian life in this world. It's going to be. But if you have a good foundation of Scripture to stand firm, then that's going to help you through. And Paul encourages Timothy, don't cave into peer pressure. Remember what you've been taught. Remember the, the Scriptures. Stand fast. Hold firm to the Word of God that you've been taught. And thank God for Timothy's mother that she instilled this Scripture in his life when he was young. She not only fed him a baby bottle and gave him physical food, she gave him spiritual food. She nurtured him spiritually. She taught him Scripture from early on. So he had a strong foundation from which to build on. What a great gift to pass down to your children. The gift of faith and the gift of Scripture. The, the foundation of, um, of Scripture. You know what? Times are no different today for our, our children. Our, if our children are going to follow Christ today, they're, they're going to need a firm, strong foundation. Amen? You know, we, we live in a, in a world that if you're going to live for Christ, you're going to be going against the grain. And if they're going to hold firm and experience God's purpose and will for their lives, they need to be grounded in, in Scripture. They need an anchor in, in God's Word. I was just reading this this morning. Advertisers and marketers target our children. Uh, they, they appeal to their insecurities and their rebellion. You know, there, there's a, a, a branch of advertising that deals strictly with our children, that, that targets our children, that targets their minds. And uh, uh, Julie Halpin, CEO of Geppetto Group, which uh, specializes in marketing to kids, says this, more than anything, it's a competition for a share of the mind. She said, corporations try to claim this share of the mind from every possible angle. Imagine your child, she said, sitting in the middle of a large circle train track and tentacles like octopus reach out to the child from every angle. And she says, that's how we try to reach the child to get a portion of their, their mind. And she says, if you own a child at an early age, you can own this child for years to come. And Hitler understood the, 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 the truth of this. Hitler said, he alone who owns the youth gains the future why do you think he targeted the youth he had his own youth why do you think uh, our children today are being targeted at such an early age you know what parents if you're not going to teach your children somebody else will exactly the media will tv will uh the the local drug dealer will uh somebody will gladly fill that gap for you but it's it's our job as parents to teach the word to our children. It's nobody else's. We can't pass that on to the church. It's not John Gabriel's fault, or, or, or uh, not fault, yeah, well, it might be his fault, I don't know. <laughs> but it's not his sole responsibility to, uh, uh, to train the children. Look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, page 137 in your Pew Bible. Keep your place in Timothy there. Deuteronomy 6, page 137 in your Pew Bible, in the Old Testament. And it is going to be a short message today because I understand we have, don't have children's church or nursery. We did want the kids to be with their families, uh, and I know it's, it's difficult. Um, so. <laughs> Couldn't have timed that one better, could we? Huh? De Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. When are you to be teaching and instructing your children? Always. Always. You know what? You got to go to Home Depot, get some plies, bring your children with you. Man, that's a teaching moment. Always be about teaching your, your children. Always be laying that foundation of Scripture. Always be demonstrating this is what true faith looks like. This is what honesty looks like. This is what love looks like. This is what trust in God looks like. Always be demonstrating that to your children. You can't just drop your kids off at Sunday school and expect the church to do it. God gave the mandate to the parents. You know what the, our, you know what the church's job is? know what John Gabriel's job is? His job is not to, to train your children. His job is to come alongside the parents and help you. That's his job. 
Somewhere we've gotten in our mindset, we drop our kids off at church, and it's up to the church to train our children. We drop our kids off at school, and it's up to the school to train our children. Parents, it's up to you. Children are God's gift to us, and how we raise them is our gift back to God. And I'm here to tell you, there's no greater investment you can make in this life than to pass faith down to your children and to pass a firm foundation of God's word down to your children. We have more resources available today than, than uh, uh, Eunice and Lois had, right? The resources are, are, are plentiful. Uh, it, it's up to you. I know when we were growing up, Brian can attest, my son's here. He's single and 28, by the way, okay? okay. Oh, 26, 26, okay? All right, 26. Do uh, you want to stand up, Brian, or no? Okay. All right. Okay. Wow. I just lost my train of thought. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. When, when we were growing up, we had what was called uh, Bible verse time, right? And uh, I had three boys, my wife and I, that's five of us. And so in the morning, uh, I would say no TV. No, no TV. That's your time to read the Scripture. And I would hold them accountable by, by once a week. Uh, we would have, I'd yell Bible verse, and we'd all gather in the living room, and we would share how God spoke to us in our quiet time that week. Like Monday was my turn, Tuesday was Maritza's, and uh, Wednesday's was Kevin, Thursday's was Brian's, I think, and, and Friday was Ryan's. So that's how I held them accountable, and it was a time where we got to talk and just, uh, you know what, so it's, it's up to you how you train your children. I'm saying this is what worked well for us and our family. You know, shut the TV off. Shut it off. Talk to your kids. Find out how their day is, is going. Because uh, what I learned through that also is we not only talked about Scripture, I learned what was going on in their lives as well. And we got to, to draw closer to our children. So impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you get up, when you're at home, when you're on the couch. Always be, be talking about, about your, uh, uh, the Word of God to, to your children. Um, it's important that our children have a firm foundation in Scripture. But you know what, parents? you got to read it. you got to know what, words, what the Word of God says. You cannot lead your children to where you're not at yourself. You have to read God's Word. You have to obey God's Word. And then you have to live God's Word. There was a young man going off to college, and the dad said to him, Son, don't let them take Jonah from you thinking the swallowed by a big fish story would be the first thing to go by these secular professors. So the, the son went off to college, and four years later he came back, and the dad says, well, son, did they take Jonah from you? He says, ah, Jonah, that's not even in your Bible. He says, yeah, it is. So he went and he looked at his Bible, and he, he couldn't find it. And the son says, I took Jonah out of your Bible before I left to college. And he says, what, what does it matter if I lose it at college or if you lose it through neglect. You have to be in God's word, parents. You have to study God's word. You have to set the example. You have to live it. A recent survey revealed 88% of the people said they owned a Bible. 80% said the Bible was sacred. There's an average of four Bibles in a home, in the average home. Yet only one in five read the Bible regularly. 57% only read the Bible four or less times a year. I don't know about you, but... You know, when one, an impression I want to leave upon my children is when they think about their dad or when they think about their mom, I want them to know that we were praying people and they saw us reading the Scripture. Amen. They saw us reading the Scripture. That we were men and women of, of the Scripture. They, we, we not only said you need to read your Bible, son, but we demonstrated it in our lives as well. You can't just say, do as I say. You can't just say, study about Jesus and read the Bible because if they see that disconnect between what you say and what you do, it'll seriously hinder their faith. It will. Set the example in all that you do. You can bring God's word into your home uh, many different ways, but if you don't do it, somebody else will. Proverbs 22, 6, and, and this is not a promise, but it, it, it's not 100% foolproof, but Proverbs 22, 6 says, train your child in the way he should go, and when he is older, he will not turn from it. Not 100% foolproof, but you know what? Your children will stand a much better chance of, of, of having this anchor of God's word as they try to live a godly life in this ungodly world. They will have this as a firm foundation, and they will be less likely to be led astray by their peers. 
because they know the truth of God's word and they have a strong faith that they saw lived out in, in your life. Now I want to relieve some guilt here from parents. We make mistakes, don't we? We make mistakes and ultimately understand something. Kids make their own choices. Good or bad, kids will ultimately, you're not, you're not 100% responsible for your kids' actions. They choose to accept your faith or they will choose to reject your faith that you try to pass down to them. Parents of rebellious kids, you face a myriad of, of emotion from anger to grief to sorrow, depression, guilt, and, and helplessness. John, uh, 3 John 4 says this, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. And I think conversely of that, there is no greater grief that a parent can experience than when their children are walking in lies. They're not walking in the truth of God's word. Remember, parents, God loves your children more than you do. Continue to pray for them and, and don't give up. Remember that, that son who, even when his mother was lowered into the ground, he, he finally became a, a, a Christian. But don't let your children's actions define who you are, and don't get caught up in the what-if game. You can't do it. Meanwhile, what you could do is let your children see Christ in you. Let them see how you live out your faith, how you live out God's Word. Show them what a life looks like that is based on the Word of God. And use everyday opportunities to, to, to show them. Again, you can't lead someone where you're not at yourself. You have to lead by example. And your children will follow your example, good or bad. They'll follow your example. Show your children how to stand firm on the Word of God, live a life of faith, and admit when you're, when you're wrong. You may not get everything right, but what you will show them is this, that I am a person who depends upon God. And yes, I may, I may fail sometime, but I depend upon God. Let them see your, your faith lived out. Give your children the wonderful gift of sincere faith and a strong, secure foundation on God's word. Mom and dads, I encourage you both to live out your faith 24-7 and to teach your children the word of God. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, I thank you that it's never too late. That maybe we blew it with our children, but we can have an impact on our grandchildren's lives. So, Father, I pray for all those who are here today, Father. I thank you again for the mothers who are here today. And, Lord, I know it's sometimes very challenging to be a mom, to live out a faith, uh, to, to teach the truth. Father, I ask that you encourage and equip every mother and grandmother here today. Help them to be uh, uh, godly examples in their home no matter how old their children are. I pray our children will be like Timothy, who had great faith and a firm foundation. And we pray for the children who are not here right now or not walking in, in step with you as they should. Maybe they strayed from your ways and your truth. And we pray that you will bring them back home, Father. We pray you'll help the dads as well to be godly dads and, and good examples in the home. Father, I thank you that it's not too late you are the God of many chances, Father, and you can, you can turn things around for your good and for your glory. Lord, for the moms and dads who are here today, who have young children, oh, Father, I pray that you'll help them to set a good example in a home. Seems like the family is under so much attack today. There are so many influences upon our children from the, from the media to from the school and their friends and peer pressure, and uh, Satan seems to be attacking our children younger and younger. And even the institution of marriage itself and family is under attack. So, Father, I pray for these families who are here today. I pray for those who are experiencing grief here today, who have gone through a difficult time, perhaps with their parents, or, or maybe they've gone through a divorce, that you would help them to be a good mom or a good dad to their child. Help them to, to be a good Christian in the home as a... As, uh, uh, Eunice was. Even though the dad wasn't a believer, it was through her, her godly example that Timothy became a good godly man. So Father, I pray for every person here today that they will be a man or woman of faith. They will pass that faith on down to their children or their grandchildren. And that our children will have a firm foundation 
of the truth of your word. And Father, we ask all these things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.